Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, some of the steps that we take at LMAX that let us keep on releasing to production week after week, confident that everything's going to keep working correctly. So just oh, if the slide's going to advance. Um, oh, I think it starts working. So yeah. So just very briefly, a couple of words about us. We launched about three years ago, um, and we run a financial trading exchange. Um, grown really fast over the past three years, but really we don't want to talk about the company, just want to focus on technology, because we feel it's the technology that really gives us our competitive advantage. And in order to get that benefit, we need to keep releasing it out there. But at the same time, we've got to do it right, because if, if, we, if we screw up, we get something wrong, it's not just site goes down, we lose business. If our customers can't trade, can't manage their positions, they're losing money every second. And if they're losing money, well, and it's our fault, well, that comes back to us. So we want to be agile. We want to keep releasing frequent releases, get us out the whole time. But at the same time, we've really, really got to be confident that everything's working. So right from the beginning, we've been practicing continuous delivery. Um, the software team was set up by Dave Farley, who lit quite literally wrote the book on the subject. The key tenet for that is always, always keep the code base in a releasable state. It's our first practice. So every commit we make is a potential release candidate, and it's up to all our automated testing and build tools to try and prove us wrong. So the, the first thing that we, we tell a new starter, really, is every time you press that commit button or git commit, what you're actually saying is, I believe this code I've written is safe to go into production. And that's really the core of our, core of our culture. Um, so, continuous delivery means every commit is a potential release candidate. It doesn't mean that every commit actually goes into production. We, we release every two weeks generally, on, normally on a Saturday morning, because we've, we've got this luxury that the, the financial markets all, all close for, for two days, shut down 10 o'clock Friday night and open up 10 o'clock again Sunday night. Um, and for us, we haven't felt the need to, to move on to continuous, continuous deployment yet. Um, the time may well come, but we've got other priorities at the moment. But even so, two weeks, a lot of people find is a pretty, pretty grueling schedule. Um, so I'm not going to give a great talk on continuous delivery. There's plenty of other talks out there. Just going to have a very, very brief overview of some of the, the core parts of our, our pipeline. The real focus on it all, though, is automated testing throughout, right from the moment you hit commit, through a, huge, a really expansive automated testing phase with integration tests, acceptance tests, performance tests, reliability tests, migration tests. But throughout all this process, throughout all these different test environments, we're releasing exactly the same way as releasing to production. Same binaries, same tools, same deployment scripts. So we're testing the release all the way through as well. So I do just want to talk for a moment about our functional testing, because this is really where our confidence in the system begins. Right built into our culture is functional acceptance testing. Every story we deliver, one of the first steps in the story is to build automated acceptance tests for all the acceptance criteria. And a story is absolutely not done until all those tests are written, all of them enabled in CI and passing every time. And that discipline has let us build up a library of now about 7,000 full end-to-end -end acceptance tests, black box tests, driving the system through external APIs, through Selenium to drive web browsers in exactly the same way as the users use, would interact with the system, both internal admin users and external customers. And that acts as a real substantial regression suite and so it lets us Let's us spot regressions immediately. And going back to the keeping, keeping the build always in a releasable state, when something breaks, the first thing we do is, is stop and fix it. This does require discipline. So the tests require maintenance. Um, we have to keep a, uh, um, a lid on intermittent tests. We're running sort of a large distributed asynchronous system. And so intermittency in tests is a problem. We really strive to keep, to keep on top of that. We've got it down to about now. I think we generally have two or, two or three intermittent failures per run out of 
7,000, so that's not bad going. But um, we actually dedicate to, we have a, um, a practice we've picked up from the Chromium project, the idea of a build sheriff, which is a, a daily role that rotates around the team. Um, so everyone's sheriff for a day, and their job is to keep the build green, um, to find, find any, um, anyone who breaks things, revert immediately. It's always revert first, ask questions later, and then in the background actually work on whatever test is showing up as most intermittent at the moment and trying to get that fixed. So we've got all this, all this testing, big pipeline, gives a lot of confidence that code functionally works. Release, release has been well tested. It's been tested well, probably 20 times a day in test environments or more. So everything should be great going into production. Unfortunately, well, sometimes that is true. Often it is true. The ideal world, I come in on Saturday morning to do the release, click the button, sit back, cup of tea, twiddle my thumbs for a little bit, um, watch the backups, and then go home because it's done. Sometimes it goes like that, but sometimes it doesn't. And we were still finding, despite all this automation, all this testing, we're getting releases which take 15 hours, and everyone's tired and cross and grumpy, and no one wants to volunteer for the release rotor. And we get more bugs, and not a great world. And at the same time, luxury of this great two-day two -day window when we can do a release, but one of the downsides of that is everything's closed for two days. So our release finishes at, even when it goes well, finishes at midday on Saturday. And we don't actually know that it's really working until 10 PM Sunday night when everyone starts trading. And normally it is OK, but occasionally we find 10 PM Sunday night, there's something's broken, trades aren't being reported correctly. Or, and midnight, 2 AM, Sunday night, Monday morning, not a great time to be have half the team wait trying to fix production issues. So we stop and say, well, how can we make, how can we make this better? We need, to, we need to solve this problem. Now, every time we had some sort of issue Sunday night, we'd stop back, have a retrospective, and start saying, well, monitoring. How did we miss this? What, was, what should we have been looking at? What metrics should have we been recording? How could we, how could we tell that the idle system isn't working properly? And we looked and found that actually there wasn't one thing. To, to look at the whole system and all the different metrics and decide if everything is working is a big, big problem. And what would, what would cause us an issue one Sunday night? We might have to put monitoring place for that. And a couple of months later, we'd have a, a different issue. And trying to monitor everything, you want to monitor as much as you can, but trying to monitor everything and then infer the full health of the system is a really complex problem. So we stopped back for a minute and said, actually, well, we've really built this big testing, automated testing framework that can drive the system. So can we actually perhaps adapt that and start to start trying to test in our live production system? And that led to us to building what we're called testing in live. So this is a lot more than just smoke testing. We always had a part of the release checklist that you log into the system, click in various places, check everything looks OK. But when the system's running idle, no one's trading, it's hard to really fully, fully get a picture of what's going on. What we need to know is we need to know if something's, something's broken, some component's not working, the moment we get in, the release is finished, rather than waiting till Sunday night. A few things that testing live is absolutely not is not functional testing. We've already done that. We've run 7,000 acceptance tests once an hour for two weeks before we, before we release. If we're finding a functional defect in production, that's a way, way too late. We need that much, much earlier in the pipeline. It's not performance testing. Again, we've got a performance test environment. We're constantly performance testing the code. We've got lots of performance monitoring in production, which displays on big screens around the office and sets off alerts if trades take more than a few milliseconds. Um, what it is, is it's testing, testing this deployment. We know the code can work. We know it can be fast enough. But is it working right here, right now? And actually looking through the problems we were getting, whenever we, they generally fell into sort of whatever the root cause. They fell into one sort of effect, which was a particular component misconfigured, a bit of communications not working. So 
there's a bit of a system that can't talk to other bits. Um, communication isn't flowing through. So the plumbing's not, not quite right. So that's really where we focused on. Um, the com communication between the components and the system. So we step back and we just, just said, what are, the, what are the really critical components in the system and the critical channels, and try to build, design our tests around that. How can we test those? It doesn't have to be comprehensive. What we need to do is we need to focus on the, the critical paths, the bits that, if those fail, if those have an outage there, everything breaks. There's some bits of the system around the edges that, if it's offline for a few hours, it's inconvenient, but not a big problem. There's other bits that, if someone can't trade, that's a major issue and you need the whole team fixing it straight away. So really focusing on the high value areas. So just as a quick, very short example, actually what a live test can be, and they can be really, really simple. So we've already got testing framework which lets us so drive the system for the APIs. So we can write a test that it's test checking that when orders get placed, market data gets published to people who are subscribing. So all the test has to do is log on to a trading API, log on to a market data API, set up a subscription for the data, place a couple of orders, and then check the corresponding market data is ret retrieved. And it turns out that a test like this, even though it looks very simple, actually tests a large part of the system that we need. So we stopped back and we, we looked through the system and we said, what are the key paths we want to, be, want to be testing? And how can we come up with some simple scenarios that test these as comprehensively as possible? And it turns out we actually don't need very many scenarios. Because as I said, we're not functional testing. We really are. We're focusing here on testing the communication between components, checking that a component is processing events and emitting them and Downstream components, downstream services receiving them. So, say one each test case can cover really quite a large part of the system. So, with a small number of tests, you can very quickly build up a really high degree of coverage. I think actually the point went live with this once going going. We actually had five or six tests in place, and that's all it took to have a much, much, much higher degree of confidence that Saturday lunchtime when everyone went home from the release system was working. One challenge for us, absolutely, though, was test isolation. We really, really, really did not want, or could not have, our, our test data, our test orders, test trades, polluting the, the real live business data. Can't have them appearing in market data, can't have them appearing in finance reports, can't have real, real money transactions flowing around. But at the same time, we really do want to test production, we're going to be testing the same hardware, the same software, the same running processes. So how can we get that balance there? Well, we don't really want to put special hidden flags in or have toy currencies running in our production system, because that seems dangerous. Um, that might get, might get that wrong. So we actually looked at, at a level inside the system, how can we logically partition it? So same, same deployment, same running processes, but two logically separate areas. And we came up with this idea of virtual venues that we can sort of partition inside the data model the bits of the system into separate trading venues. So every account, every instrument belongs to, belongs to one venue and can only, can only even be aware of the existence of other, other objects in its same venue. And this gives us a complete logical partitioning. So same running system, and, we, and now in our production deployments we have production venue, and then a test venue. Um, so, so we've really got that separation now, and it goes right through to, the, sort of, to all the reporting levels. So this can be running the whole time now. Started off just at releases, but actually become a monitoring tool. We running the whole time during the week, during trading, and no one's aware of it. So let's say once we've got this, the, um, once we've got the testing in live working, in production, we started putting it back into CI as well. Because these tests were built using our acceptance test tools, first thing we did is get them running in, in acceptance tests, because we need to know that these tests are absolutely robust and absolutely working. But then we can start putting them into other test environments as well. So for instance, staging, which we use to test our most, most realistic production-like environment, 
we've been doing a lot of work into automating our staging releases so that we can get quicker feedback when deployment's broken. So now, testing live runs in staging. So automatically, we can do a staging release three times a day, say, fully testing the production release, and then running testing in live at the end to make sure that make sure it's, it's working exactly the same as production. So when we come to release to production, we've done a full rehearsal. We've tested exactly, exactly the processes we're going to be following many, many, many times before. So I think really the moral is that you should never get a surprise when you get into production. Um, the, if you're finding a problem in production, really that means there's a bug with your test systems. They're not comprehensive enough. But more was found. When you get there, it's worth having some tests at the end just to make sure that it is right. right. Thank you very much.